So what you're about to see is a little clip from class, my power and influence class, where we were talking about here's what good leadership looks like, here's how power works, here's how influence works, and we work through all that. And we're also simultaneously uh, working through research about how bad leadership works, destructive leadership, tyrannical, pseudo-transformational, uh, all kinds of different facets of um leadership and good leadership and bad leadership. When I get to the section where we talk about charismatic leadership, they're doing their research, but I'm asking them to look at the negative side of charismatic leadership. And as they do, they discover, yeah, it can be twisted. It's bad. And we reviewed one particular article that was about Trump and how charismatic leadership was infused with populism in order to give us what we're seeing here. And I thought you might want to see this because it's it's really powerful and it helps you understand why Trump's followers adhere to him so closely. So that's the background and we're going to get into this. This is a Zoom view of my classroom and we can just have that discussion. We have just finished reading pretty much everything. There's a little, like a chapter or something from, from Goldsmith next week and some other little bit. So we finished reading everything from Pfeffer, Cialdini, uh, Zigarelli, and Powell. So that's, a, that's like the good side. Then you also did all the research on, you know, abusive supervisors and uh, pseudo-transformational leaders and tyrannical leadership and this, that, and the other, right? So with all of that, what do you make of this? I'm, I'm not trying to make partisan political points. I'm asking you to just look at his leadership and why he does what he does. Adrian, any thoughts? Um, I don't know. It, it keeps them relevant. It keeps them relevant. Yes, you're you're getting, closing in on it. Yeah, so he's, with all his craziness that he says, people are like, oh, did you hear what Trump said or whatever? And it's not, conversations. and it's not even... <laughs> How could he say that? That he said that is um, a design. It's not the. It's not a bug. It, it's a feature. It's not a bug, right? Like okay. So follow me here. Uh, I'm going to show you. Somebody found this great article in the research. We were talking about uh, <laughs> charismatic leadership. Mm -hmm. Now you all have. What, 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 what are we laughing at? Yeah, so so somebody found this article, and I thought, wow, this I, I went read through the whole article, and I thought, wow, there, there's a great teaching point. So sometimes when we think about charismatic leadership, I've had multiple students who walked into my class thinking, charismatic leadership, that's the end all, that's the be all in leadership, that's where you want to be, you just be charismatic and they follow you, and no, it's freaking dangerous. It can be used just as badly as it can be used for good. It depends on how. And you saw that when when you were going through your stuff about uh, charismatic leadership. And you found some really good things about how it works and why it works and, and that sort of thing. So let's go through this article because this is really interesting. This paper explores the role anger plays in charismatic movements. We argue that resent. I don't know if I can pronounce that. Hold on a second. Uh, where is the, let me see if I can uh, pronounce that. Ressentiment. Ressentiment. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> that ressentiment is associated with the need to blame outsiders. It's key to theorizing the emotional energy that charisma delivers to revolutionary people. Okay. So this, he's tapped into this anger of people who feel like things are not going well for them. Does that make sense? Okay, again, I'm not being partisan. This is that's not what this is about. It's not about the politics of it. It's about how he's operating as a leader. Okay. Since Max Weber introduced char uh, charisma into the social sciences over a century ago, it's become impossible to ignore. Recently, the rise of leaders such as Trump has reignited the field of char uh, charisma research, relating it to wider developments involving the resurgence of nationalism and populist rejections of globalism. So, He's not just a nationalist, he's not just a populist, he's not just an isolationist, and he is very charismatic in the way that he operates. But the charisma and the uh, populism, when you put those two together, you get this profound, it's almost like a chemical reaction. You know, like when you put uh, hydrogen and oxygen together, you get water, right? At the right, you know, H2O, right? There's this reaction that's happening because you put those two elements together. 
Okay, we pull on threads from past research on charismatic emotions and charismatic rupture. Um, however, we take these strands one step further by focusing on anger, which we see as emotion that entails a profound dissatisfaction and injury to one's social worth and identity and longing for revenge. So who's got this feeling of injury to their social worth and identity? Okay, so if you roll back the clock 20 years ago, Democrats were sticking up for the little guy. That's the way they always framed themselves. And that shifted. Somehow along the way, that shifted to an identity politics. And the little guy that the factory job has left and they, they feel like they're, they've been uh, displaced by society are the ones that love, 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 generally, not all, but the people that love, love, love Trump to death, like they just can't get enough of Trump. For this reason, that that's what that is largely what's happening with these followers. Okay, this is because anger is the most potent emotion for enlivening charisma's capacity for status quo disruption. He's a disruptor, like everybody knows that. But like he's he's more establishment than the establishment, right? Nikki Haley and Trump are about to have their uh, their face off in South Carolina here in just a couple weeks, right? So it's coming up real soon. The 24th. Early voting's already started. Early voting's already started. But she is seen as establishment, even though he's establishment and has almost all the endorsements of his party's establishment. But he's a disruptor. Why? Because he's the disruptor for this reason. You, you see where I'm going? Yes? Again, this is not political. This is looking at the leadership, what's going on here. Okay, this is because anger, the most potent emotion for enlivening charisma's capacity for status quo disruption, dispersing energy toward attacks on structures and institutions. Why do angry people look for charismatic leaders? Because that's what that's what's at play. Trump is not about Trump. Trump is about the followers who feel this place, who are angry, who are looking for a Trump. Does that make sense? Bernie is the opposite reflection on the other side. Right? So there's a Bernie kind of doing the same thing, although he's not nearly as relevant anymore as what he was an election cycle or two ago, and what Trump is. Okay. Um, what sorts of communities does such rageful charisma create? Probably not good ones. So let's look at it. By focusing on anger, charisma research recaptures its theory of revolution, while populism study acquires a better account for why anger of the people often it finds expression in a singular emblematic leaders. So a populist is somebody who says, well, we the people aren't going to take that anymore. But they're really generally only looking at this subset of people calling that subset the people. Does that make sense? That's how populists all throughout every but populists are particularly potent on doing that and saying you are not going to take it from you the establishment and they're, they they particularly do that sort of thing does that make sense okay so you combine those two things together the link between charisma theory and emotions has long been recognized weber or weber rather max weber writes a unique object of cultivation is the distinct subjective condition that notably represents or mediates charisma, namely, uh, namely ecstasy. Like when people get around a, charis a really charismatic leader, they're like, oh, he's just awesome, right? It's weird, but they're like almost entranced by the character. So, and Trump had, believe it or not, like some of you are not going to believe this because you're like, Trump, yeah, he's evil. And others of you are going to be like, yeah, I, I see that. Like, it, like some people see that as just awesome. It's the people that are most feeling disenfranchised, even if whether they are or aren't is immaterial. If they feel it, that's the reaction that they're they're having when they're finding somebody who's going to embody their anger and rage and and talk about tearing down the system. I'm going to drain the swamp or whatever it is. Right? Okay. At the group level. Charisma is even more capricious and fitful, surging as short-lived mass emotions that seize the public with unpredictable effect in moments of collective fervor, right? This is the stuff of riots, right? This is what, like, riots, like, you have normal people who go to work, love their family, pay their taxes, and then they just burn down that building? What happened? Right? It's that kind of stuff. Not not saying that this is what's happening every time, but this is the 
Same kind of an effect. Okay. It subsists in the basis of feelings. To survive at all, it must continually stoke emotional response through new and ever more awe-inspiring proofs. And so there's the outrage of the day that comes out, right? All right. The result is that audiences come to experience elation, the high of being part of a powerful, like-minded community, which is also amplified on social media, right? But if everybody that you know is all saying the same thing, you're kind of like, yeah, that's right. They're, they're, these people are terrible. They're, they're awful. They're, right? Both sides do that kind of thing, but you're particularly going to get this pronounced effect with, with a group like this that has this, because Trump becomes this lightning rod for the anger of the, of the group that feels put out, right? Okay. Anger stands out as an emotion that's often associated with charismatic leaders. Hitler, Martin Luther, Joan of Arc. We're talking about Martin Luther, 15th century Martin Luther. The other Martin Luther got the memo and went, you know, this isn't a good idea, guys. Let's not. Malcolm X would have, but MLK wouldn't. Um, Weber seems to have focused more on the affective states, affective means feelings, the, the feeling state of ecstasy and enthusiasm. Anger, if mentioned at all, seems subsumed as a minor voice. So that's how Weber talked about charisma. It wasn't like focus on anger, but if you put that populist piece together and that's what happens in Trump, then you get it. So Weber frequently describes a berserk, and so in some places, berserk charisma, and that's that's how they're defining this. The wrath of these berserk cases always originates out of weakness. It involves individuals who are initially enfeebled in some way, but by being untested, youthful, uh, sol solitary, insulted, or hailing from a subjected group. It's also noteworthy that this anger, uh, angry charisma manifests as solely as a striking force. Okay, recklessness and self-abandon is the key to understanding the berserk's power. If it is true that fear, no, I, listen to this carefully because this is really important. So you hear commentators talk about, well, you know, these people that support Trump, they're just afraid, they're fearful. No, they're angry. And that's what's motivating this. It's not fear driving it, it's anger. If fear concentrates the mind, we can say that anger has the opposite effect, vaporizing it. Right? You're not even thinking. What did Trump say just yesterday, day before yesterday? He talked about, like, if NATO, if you don't pay your bill, then, uh, you know, uh, somebody in NATO asks, would I, would I defend him? If they're not, yeah, you don't pay your bill. Let Russia do whatever the fleet they want. And you see in the crowd this disconnect between some people are like, yeah, and others like, that doesn't sound right. You want to let Russia do what? Right? So you're seeing like some cognitive dissonance with some, and you're seeing like other people just, um, just whatever he says is dreamy. Right? Simultaneously, you saw that effect if you, if you looked at the audience. Okay. Note that for the Hulk, a modern iteration of the Berserk theory, the hero actually grows in size and menace. We're talking about the Incredible Hulk, Hulk Smash, right? It grows in size and menace as he's overtaken by superhuman wrath. Waking up later with no conscious memory of his rampage. It's, it's almost like that kind of thing. Like, I just, I just want this to be, we're looking for a champion. That's what's going on here. Okay, so, resentment. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. What was it? I, I can't pronounce anything. I, I get in trouble with that when I try to pronounce foreign names and such. Okay, resentment. Resentiment. Resentiment. Okay, resentiment and problem solving in populist leadership. Populism is by its nature requires a bashing of elites. That what that's what populism does. These guys, they're crooks, and we're the people, and we don't we want to take that back. That's the nature of populism in, in a nutshell. Okay, so we'll briefly consider a scholarly account of Anger's role in theories and populist mobilization. In a three-wave panel survey conducted in Spain, for example, uh, they identified anger rather than fear as a common emotion behind support for populism. Again. Anger is driving the phenomenon that is Trump. However, grievances are by themselves not sufficient for explaining the movement formation. Anger seems salient for mobilization and populism primarily because it tends to direct enemy or energy toward targets that have political relevance. We're going to drain the swamp. We're going to take down these political figures. We're going to whatever it is. There's <clears throat> some focus to it. Anger's salience for motivation or for mobilization then 
owes to the fact that it's intertwined with the motivation to identify and attack the culprit as a means of promoting a corrective response. See all these bad things that have happened to me and everybody that I know, the factory closed or whatever, I don't I don't have a great job or whatever, woe is me. Well, he's going to fix it. There's almost like a messianic kind of fervor behind the most ardent supporters because I, uh, the charisma is coupled with the populistness with that kind of message and the anger is driving it. As researchers have shown, anger can easily motivate aggression toward uninvolved third parties as a form of mistaken revenge or as a spillover of vengefulness, leading actors to suspend their judgment and blame and attack innocent targets. Okay, so what is desired to happen? To, to cast down the elite who are doing all these, whatever these bad things are, as you define them. We want the, the border fixed because that's taking our jobs. Or we want these elites in Washington to have whatever happened. So, you know, that Zelensky guy in, U in Ukraine, he's bad, too. Why is he bad? He didn't do anything. Well, he's bad, too. He's, he, he's, he's hardly one of the elites. But he, it's okay to target even him because they want this and they want they, it, There's a spillover effect. You see the same spillover effect with abusive supervision. When abusive supervisors are being abusive to their people at work, there's a spillover effect where people that have been abused then are abusive to other people, not even the boss that abused them. They're abusive to coworkers. This is statistically proven. So, okay, it's the same kind of thing there. Okay, but simple anger about wrongdoing is not enough to explain the populist tendency to valorize singular leaders. For this, the social psychological mechanism of raisonnement Get that right? Uh, becomes useful. Originally described by Nietzsche as a slave revolt mentality, Rizemwal can uh, be understood as a form of psychological alchemy through which dominated groups achieve victories by overturning the established value tables and reversing good bad distinctions as they apply to themselves and their enemies. Rizemwal uh, uh, offers a form of compensation for feelings of shame, suffering, and powerlessness. So if you want to correct Trump, you don't just remove him. You have to fix the underlying issue. Now, it's the same thing when you're talking about Bernie or woke or whatever else. Get to the place where you're dealing with whatever the underlying cause of the, the issues are that people are experiencing that's causing the anger. Like, fix that, and then you won't have this kind of thing going on. But if it's not Trump, it's going to be somebody else cut out of that same cloth if you don't fix whatever is broken. Does that make sense? Uh, at the political level, members of the public can engage in magical fantasy retribution by aligning themselves with leaders who they perceive to be sufficiently powerful for discharging anger on their behalf within areas where their subjects feel impotent. You see how that is driving everything focused on through him? So he's going to be a force to reckon with because it's not just a rational choice of, do I think that? Haley's policies or Trump's policies are, right? That's not what's driving this. If it was, it, it might be different. Or do I like the character of this one or the, the character of that one? It's That's not what's driving it. This is charisma being amplified by this anger toward that end. Does that make sense? A little bit more um, under the influence of Ressonwa then, leadership can be weaponized. Yeah. Mm. It becomes a firing chamber from which populist subjects can blast volleys toward the object of their hateful, hateful cathexis. I had to look that up myself. Uh, in psychoanalysis, cathexis, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that, is the process of allocating mental or emotional energy to a person, object, or idea. I had to, I had to look that one up too. Uh, okay. And, and amid the, th should listen to this, and amid the thrill of witnessing their leader lay waste the enemies are there in their political arena. So when Trump is saying the most outrageous thing, it's not a bug, it's a feature. You get that? It's not something that is like, um, like, oh, he shouldn't have said that. Maybe he'll rethink that. No, he's going to double down and say something even more outrageous next time because that's actually drawing more of that same magnetism to him. It's crazy, but I, I think this is right. Um, 
Charismatic devotees are themselves emboldened, rework, uh, reworking their identities in ways that ameliorate negative feelings associated with this self, this value, and shame and envy. So as he is saying this, they're feeling better about themselves. The relationship between leader and led is really powerful. But here, like Bill Clinton could look into a camera and say, I feel your pain. And people would believe him. Really. Really, like millions of Americans thought, like, oh, yeah, he gets me. Right? The same kind of phenomenon here on the other side of the political spectrum with Trump, except it's driven by anger. Resident Wall, however, highlights the role of social problems, real or imagined, producing inner tensions and awakening desires that are imaginatively resolved through weaponization of leadership. Varga's ethnographic study of pre-World War II villages in Austria, for example, demonstrated how Nazi ideology appealed to middle-class families who suffered rapid status decline in the wake of World War I. Now, I'm not comparing Trump to Nazis. That's not what I'm doing here. What I am saying is that same feeling of being disenfranchised or, or losing out or, or being less than or whatever is the same kind of thing that's driving this that was driving that. That make sense? Victor Orban's strongman politics in Hungary der derives from workers' sense of class dislocation. And that's, a, that's what's going on in Hungary. Across a contemporary range of European contexts, national populism is in fact a displacement of experiences of, the, of dispossession and disenfranchisement. Now, the, the conclusion of the theory before we get to how it affects Trump is this. When it makes room for anger, charisma theory, which is otherwise being preoccupied with loving affection, and again, when we think of charismatic leaders, we think, oh, that charismatic leader, right? It's been preoccupied with that positive kind of sentiment. It obtains a ready-made framework for understanding the political relevance of its aggressive side. Conversely, populism, which is frequently understood in terms of popular resentments toward elite-born social structures, comes to acquire a theory for explaining how and why such movements often coalesce around emblematic leaders who are passionately beloved. Like, if you didn't understand why people just, like, if before this class tonight you came in and were like, I don't get why people can really like Trump like as much as they do. Like, they, they like, love, the people that love him, love him. Right? No, like, that's not even in question. There are people that are like, eh, Trump. And then there are people that are Trump supporters that are, like, really, really passionate. That's what's going on. Okay. The Trump phenomenon presents parad uh, paradigmic uh, example of the twinning of populism and personal charisma. It's through ang angry populism. Charismatic populists consist of an emotional relationship between a people and a leader who bonded together through shared anger launch volleys at a target of rage. Now, I've read uh, quite a bit in these, in these um, well, about uh, all these categories about, you know, authoritarians or pseudo-transformational. And I, I see true pseudo-transformational. I think, wow, that's Trump, right? He has all the, char uh, the charisma involved, but the ideal influence is not there toward a positive end. It's toward a enemies. It's, it's always directed at enemy, enemies. Like there's like, it flows that way. So he fits in that um, pseudo transformational kind of camp as well. Okay, many working class, again, I'm not attacking anyone for any political reason. I'm trying to explain the leadership side. Many working class and middle class, especially white Americans who understand themselves as embodying the nation's values, feel that their, their right to the American dream has been obstructed by others. Minorities, refugees, state employees, women, so on. Okay, so minorities, I think, okay, this is in a sociological, um, what's the journal, journal of critical sociology. I think they, they, they do have some bias here with that, but maybe that's part of it. Uh, refugees, yeah, there's definitely something there with the people spilling over the border because the people that are economically downtrodden see that as taking their jobs, and that's, that's they see as a locus of a problem. Okay, uh, state employees. I'm not exactly sure. Women and so on. I think there is something to the identity politics, though, being something that is supercharging this. So when they see identity po politics playing out, breaking against them, there that causes extra anger within that group. Okay. To these people, a picture of a bygone America eviscerated by bad trade deals. By the way, Bill Clinton signed the NAFTA deal. Right. Do you remember that? It was like the mid-90s, 95 or something like that. That was that was Bill Clinton. 
it was a good, it was actually a good, solid economic piece, which was now, it's now changed to um, USMCA. MCA? Yeah. Um, okay, to these people, a picture of a bygone America eviscerated by bad trade deals, signed by financial elites, is, a signif is significant because it allows them to connect personally felt losses to wider social processes and institutions. So think about the inflation that you have over the last five years. Like, if you're making what you were making five years ago, you have 80% of the purchasing power that you had five years ago. Right? That's what inflation has done to you. So unless you've been promoted or got some kind of raises here, you're down 80, down to uh, down 20% of what you were in real purchasing power. So if you're mad every time you go to Walmart, you might be a candidate for this kind of anger. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, perceived threat of loss and ignominy is enough to make people fearful, anxious, and angry. But again, the emphasis is on the angry. Close attention to the case at hand leaves little doubt that Trump is singularly beloved by his fans. And he, he really is. You might hate him. You might love him. I don't know. Right? But even if you just suspend your disbelief, if you're in a camp that doesn't love him, like, because these people, there's a certain core that love him, love him, love him. Now, there's a squishy middle that is like, eh, really? Why? What's he, what's he doing? Why is he saying this stupid stuff? And then there's a part that hates him. But there's the people that love him, they love him. Okay, close attention to the case at hand leaves little doubt that Trump's singularly beloved by his fans. To quote so often used uh, to give evidence for this point came from Trump himself at a campaign stop in Iowa in 2016. I have the most loyal people. Did you ever see that? He's referring to the polls indicating high levels of loyalty among Trump supporters. I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. My people stay. People love, and they were like okay with him saying that. Okay, so if you heard him say that and you were okay with him saying that, that like you're in a different camp than like going, you know, you probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> okay, this is the correct interpretation for a large share of Trump's following. In the logic of weaponization of the leadership discussed above, Trump is meant to go on violent rampage. Listen, this is what his people want. He's meant to go on, now, this could be metaphorical. This could be just tearing down the system. It doesn't mean, like, he's going to go beat people up or something like that. He's not, like, uh, a vigilante superhero or something. In the logic of the weaponization of leadership discussed above, and remember, this is the dark side of, char uh, of charisma. This is how we got here, because somebody actually found this article in, in your research this past week. Trump is meant to go on violent rampages against those who are supposedly the source of their shame. The Fifth Avenue elites, the swamp-dwelling Washingtonians, the immigrants, the racial minorities, those who are taking their rightful place. So he's supposed to be doing combat on their behalf. The stylistic con uh, consistency of such interventions is suggestive, but not of someone who is being forgiven for violent rhetoric. Rather, there is a sense of celebration here, indicating that such rhetoric is the very reason that he's loved. Are you seeing a very different picture than you saw before we started that? Like, wow. A New York Times analysis of 11,000 of the president's tweets found that he attacked people or things at nearly three times the rate that he praises himself. And he praises himself a lot. Right? We therefore suggest that expressions of anger are intrinsic to the kind of charismatic figure that Trump cuts for his audience. Again, it's not a bug. It's a feature. This is what people want. He's embodying their anger. Right? Or not, not all people, obviously. This is what the people that follow him want. They talk at some length about uh, January 6th in here. The conclusion, sociologists often associate charisma with a love and affection that develops with the cultic milieu around the leader. In such a vision, charisma is seen as smaller nuclear force that binds leaders and followers together through passionate union of affection of emotion. That's normally how we think about charisma. The prevailing focus on leader love may gloss over more sinister, aggressive aspects of charismatic leadership. We draw on Weber's neglected concept of berserk charisma, that is, charisma acquired through self-abandoning, bloodthirsty rage. We can connect this idea to existing works in the field of populism studies. We specifically identified raisonnement as a bridging concept that clarifies why populist subjects who experience anger and psychological discomfort over real or perceived powerlessness 
uh, seek angry, rageful leaders. And again, if it's not Trump, if you don't fix whatever's underlying, you get somebody else who will do the same thing. The sociological import for our contribution lies in the identification of anger as an important touchstone for both charisma and populism. In our view, disenfranchised and seemingly powerless populist subjects favor rageful, charismatic leaders because they perceive them as an effective Molotov cocktail who can detonate the seemingly intractable structures of social power. That last line sums him up. That's exactly what they're voting for when they're voting for him. What do you think? Makes sense. They, like, I think that everything in there is painted from a... Uh, I think I have such a hard time with now in today's politics, and I'm trust me, I'm not a drug like lover or anything like that. But everything is like this. It's so sided. Like they're it has gotten I'm much like, more cantankerous than it was ten years ago. Really Certainly, people that did articles and research and everything else, you find what you're looking for anywhere that you look. So I wish that they would actually use multiple examples and sure. just start this out as the right wing effect or whatever this is actually called as the subtitle. You know, in the very very top, you scroll up to the top. Uh, contingent politics of right wing authoritarian. Yeah, this is all. Right. I'm not sure how. I'm not sure that this. So, so Trump gets painted as extra. That, that's a good point. He gets painted. Uh, Trump and MAGA, particularly, gets painted as ultra right. I'm not sure it's ultra right. It's ultra angry. It's like it's taken a weird turn from people that are actually conservative on the right end of the political spectrum, they're not. They're somewhere else. I'm not saying that they're left, but they're like upside down or so. I don't know how to describe it, but they're they're not the same thing as somebody who is traditionally very conservative is, is looking at that going, that's not conservative. I don't know what that thing is, but that's not right. Right. So it's it's different than but again it's a journal of soci sociology a critical sociology, all the and so so they're going to have a left wing perspective to begin with, and I try to temper that by explaining a few pieces of the puzzle here. Well, they, no, and what I'm saying is, I think that no, everything that we're pulling out, right, like and actually showing mm -hmm. all this psychological, sociological uh, components that fit together to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But I think a lot of people are starting to get turned off because it's always like we don't say. Like when we talk about hate, like I'll say, like the Coast Guard, they have their civil rights training. The mm -hmm. only hate symbols that they show in their civil rights training are all white power hate symbols. Right. There's more hate symbols. Than I that. honestly, honestly, that thing is is one of those factors that's driving this because people are going, I'm not like that, and when they they know from their own experience, I'm not like that, and then this is overlaid over them as if they're the problem. They're angry, we're causing more of this. It's not just that. Show the other eight symbols. I, I understand exactly what I understand and exactly so what you're saying. People start shutting off. They won't have conversations over this when they're doing right. something, even though all the material there goes, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Everyone just kind of goes like, yeah, I understand. Yeah, we hate those right wingers or. Oh my gosh, we aren't like that at all. So That's not the only piece of the puzzle, but that is a piece of the puzzle. And until we actually start talking to each other instead of just saying you're bad because you're in the other, we keep othering each other. Yep. Right? Yeah. What, what, we, we said this uh, a few weeks ago. It was either this class or the, I, I teach in the same classroom, and this is, this is a pain for me because I can't remember if I said this to you or to the other graduate class that I teach in the same classroom. But we can either find unity or we can find differences. Do we have that conversation in here? I don't think. Okay, so it must have been my other class. If we want to find differences, you and I, Carolyn, we can find differences. Black, white, male, female, different life experience, different roles, different whatever. We can find differences all day long. Or we can find unity all day long if we look for unity. And we've we spent all our time in the last decade or so finding every difference that we could possibly find and amplifying all the differences and then other other people who are different from us. Rather than like we want you and I want 98% of the same stuff, maybe 95%. Let's say that, 
right? We want a happy life. We want to be successful. We want to grow. We neither of us want to be discriminated against, right? We we, we can list all those same things that we actually want. So we can find great unity in there, but we've gone the other direction, and people on on both sides of this actually feel disenfranchised and with legitimate grievances. And but again, to understand his leadership, you actually have to look at his followers. Now, I got there because I was looking at this. I was looking at, this was one of the things with the uh, charismatic leadership. By the way, up through today, all of these categories, I went back through all the blues, and I you know, looked at it a second time to turn green, yellow, or red. So that's all done. And all we have left are the last two categories of derailed and unethical leadership. So let, let's work through uh, some, but, oh, I'm sorry. What other thoughts did you have about that article? I'm sorry, other thoughts. Did it give you some ahas? Did it have some explanatory value? Did it help you see things? Did you react against it and say, I'm not going to say anything, but that's crap. That's fine. If, if that's what you thought, that's okay. I pictured that, like, as we're going through that, I've thought about this for a very long time. So, like, this reminds me of even 1970s. I, it's, um, this is very, right. what we're going through right now feels very much like what I read about. Of 1968, 69. Right right yeah, now. it's it's really divisive. It's it's crazy divisive. Um, but it, it, some of it did make sense. Like, okay, yeah, you know, I, I get how people are angry. And that's how you know, they, they get wrapped up into that whole uh, following the charismatic leader. That that can channel that. He's a lightning rod. Look, <laughs> I, you can find that. So you find the same kind of thing in a different way, not in the angry sense, but like. Look at Barack Obama and look at Ronald Reagan. And both of them channeled Republican or Democrat, depending on which one you're looking at, their values. Like when you heard Ronald Reagan speak, if you were a conservative, you're like, yeah, he's, he's speaking what I think. If you heard Obama speak and you were a Democrat, you were thinking, yeah, he's, he's articulating, right? So, but this is a different thing. This is, this is something, it's supercharged in this weird way. And again, the... When he says these, the crazier things that he says is not like, it's not something that's going to hurt him. It's something that's actually going to help him with that set of people. It's it's bizarre, but I think they're onto something. So this is really interesting. Well, when Biden came into office, and I remember my mom, she was like, Trump just did all these executive orders, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm paying attention. To of course, Biden does the same thing. Every president does the same thing in the beginning. So I, I just mentioned this for I was like, Ron, just pay attention to what happens when we shift power here. Yeah. Go over the next, just see if you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. Well, all of a sudden, there was more executive orders written in the first three days of her yeah. and then, five days of his presidency, but she had zero care. And that's the part where we're starting to kind of like lose our mind. So there's a, there's a flip side to this too. Like there's almost like another anger that's coming up from other people that are watching this, focused on this. I don't know how big the majority or minority is of these people that are enraged that are fueling this Trump thing, but there's this other group that's coming up getting angry too, and <laughs> that's going to cause the next thing to pop off. Which okay. feel by feel by his character more so like Trump. Uh, I mean, thing. you can go back to like all the little things that all of us probably hated, you know, along the way. So here's something now. I'm I'm again asserting this is not political okay this is just how this my observation i'm going to say something that's going to be like some of you're going to be like okay some of you're going to be like oh, yeah that's right covid okay I'm, this is not a conspiracy theory or anything along these lines when when covid came and trump was doing the uh operation warp speed to get a vaccine republicans generally speaking were like yeah, that's right. Get through that FDA. Well, oh, just remember this. Watch it. They're like, get through that FDA. We're going to, you know, get this thing done. Lightning time. And then Democrats were saying, I've never taken that vaccine. Biden gets elected. And then it totally flipped. How on earth? A vaccine should not depend on your political preference. Where Republicans are like, man, I'm not taking that thing. We don't know about these vaccines. And Democrats were like, have you gotten your third shot? Do you really care about people? <laughs> How on earth did that happen? But I'm telling you the thought. So when you look at leadership, don't just look at 
the leader, look at the followers, and you and you can learn a ton from what's going on with the follower, and then that makes sense. And the followers, they're going through the same patterns and same yeah. behaviors, have the same things in common and up each other. Yeah, I, so again, it's so it. bizarre that that yeah. that thing flips. So okay, I'm I'm not gonna. <laughs> it does, it but the, you know, leadership and leadership is a dance with the followers. It really is. Like you can't, you can't lead if you're, if you're not, so you ever danced, right? If you're the guy, you're leading and if the follower is not going with you or the follower doesn't want it, it's going to be very hard. It's, it's just not going to work. Okay. Okay. So that's it. Tell me what you thought about this. You can leave that in the comments below. Thank you for caring enough to listen to this whole presentation. If you did, tell me that you watched the whole thing in the comments below. Thank you for your time. We'll talk to you soon.